Hi, I'm Rory Davies and I'm from Training Together. Uh, my experience is in the emergency field, 15 years in the ambulance service and fire service. And today we're going to be talking about CPR. If we think of what the C, the P and the R stand for, it is cardiopulmonary resuscitation, so heart-lung resuscitation. If we have no function of the heart and lungs, while the brain is perhaps still alive in that short period of time, essentially to the layman, your dog is deceased. So we will start with CPR. So from the onset, if the dog did have any kind of arrest, then we'd hope to have witnessed it to see perhaps what the cause was. Main reasons are cardiac reasons in an old pet, but young pets are just like children, swallow things and investigate, so get stung and bitten, so allergic reactions and reactions to venomous snakes, which in this country we're only looking at the adder, which isn't deadly to adults, but perhaps to a child or a small animal would be. So there's a number of reasons why uh, a pet would be unconscious uh, and not breathing, and those we need to try and establish pretty early on. So just like in human first aid, we would check for dangers if we weren't already with our pet. So if we walked into a room and saw our pet was collapsed, we'd need to obviously do an initial assessment and check for danger first of all. We're not going to engage with uh, any kind of first aid until such time as we are sure that we are going to be safe. So once we've established we're safe, we've checked for dangers, we would then approach our pet safely in this case and check for some kind of response. So we can either shake or a good pat. Hello Snoopy, Snoopy answer me. So no response. So we establish that Snoopy is now unconscious. But we still can't establish whether Snoopy requires CPR. So what we need to establish is if the heart is still beating or whether there's any breathing at all. So what we would do all at the same time, we would extend the airway, open the airway, extend the tongue, which we pull out in this manner, and we'd put the tongue between the, the, the front teeth and the side teeth, which are a little lower, and we'd close the mouth. So we've opened the airway with regards to the tongue and the throat. And we'd look, listen and feel. So we'd go down to the airway, we'd listen for any breathing, we would feel any breathing on our cheek, and we can also put the hand on the chest, feel the chest rise and fall, looking down the line of the chest for 10 seconds. In that 10 seconds, we also put our hand on the inside leg behind the knee and feel for that pulse. A pulse is where a vein runs over a bone, so if depressed slightly, you should feel the pressure of that blood trying to squeeze through the vein. If we don't get any pulse for up to, and, or breathing for up to 10 seconds, we need to begin CPR. If we establish a pulse but there's no breathing, then we can assume that we've got a breathing issue like choking, anaphylaxis, allergic reaction, internal swelling, which is impeding the breathing, and then we might want to assist with that breathing initially, and no compressions. We listen for 10 seconds, eight, nine, 10, and we come up and we've established that our pet has no heartbeat and is not breathing. So therefore CPR is required. At this stage with human first aid, this is the time that we would call for an ambulance. With animals, unfortunately, we don't have pet ambulances. Some counties do, but most times not. So we need to decide on a plan of action at this stage. Are we going to start with CPR? If we do engage with CPR, we need to decide how we're going to r resolve the issue and get the pet to a vet or get the vet to us. So we need to decide what we're going to do. Are we going to get up and run to our car? Please be mindful of trying to get that pet to a vet there is no way we can drive and do CPR effectively and safely for us. So think of a plan of action. If you're out and about, get someone to come to you to transport you. And if you're at home, have some kind of plan to get to the vet safely whilst doing CPR.
So once we've done our danger response, airway and breathing, we've established that a pet requires CPR. We would go in with five initial rescue breaths. So we'd open that airway again. Fortunately, Snoopy has quite a rigid airway, but in most cases, an unconscious dog would, the airway would be slightly floppy. So we open that airway again, we establish a good airway, we pull the tongue out exactly like we did before, close the mouth off, so we get a nice tongue out, mouth closed, and then we're going to breathe in through the nose in this case on a dog the size of Snoopy. So we lay in a convenient position and then we blow five rescue breaths into the nose and we can feel to see how effective our breaths are going. We've got five breaths in there and some people ask how hard do you blow in? All dependent on the size of the pet. If we've got a chihuahua we don't blow in too hard and if we've got a Burmese mountain dog we would blow in a little harder. Then we're going to, we, once we've done our five uh, breaths we're going to find the position where we're going to administer our compressions. When beginning CPR, we would lay our pet on the right side. This is due to the position of the heart, just like the humans on the left side. So if we laid them on their left, we wouldn't obviously be doing direct pressure over the heart, which wouldn't be effective CPR. So lie your pet on your right, and whichever way you remember to do that, either from the anatomy picture, or to know that your animal's always right, and you're always wrong, do it that way. So this is the elbow here, and this is where the heart is positioned. So we would find that position on our animal, just behind there, and I do it with my left hand, and as you can see, I get in quite nicely and comfortable to be able to do effective compressions. What I do is I create a nice stiff rod in my arm, I lock my elbow, put my elbow and my shoulder directly over the heart area where I'm going to be doing the compressions and I push down with my body weight just enough to compress that heart to create circulation. We do this the compressions we do 15 compressions and as you can see I'm doing it pretty slowly but we want to do it at the rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute which is to the beat of staying alive. 14, 15. Once we've done 15 compressions, we need to go back to the airway, straighten it out, open the airway again, tongue, same process again, tongue out to the side, close the mouth, and this time, two breaths. So we've done our two breaths, and we continue with 15 compressions, and we continue with that ratio, 15 to two, 15 compressions to two breaths, 15 compressions to two breaths. We continue with that until a number of reasons, until our help arrives, our action plan kicks in, pet comes back to life, which will be our best option, and also if we're too exhausted to continue, if we are stuck out, our action plan fails, and we are stuck out in, in, in the woods with no help, we would have to decide at a point when it was too difficult to continue with CPR and we'd cut it off at that stage. Fortunately, we will be able to live with the decision and knowing that we did our best. Another point to remember, when you're doing CPR, an animal of Snoopy size, we wouldn't be able to seal over the mouth and nose too large. So if you get a small animal, like a Chihuahua, then please seal over the mouth and nose. If we get a larger dog, like Snoopy and Upwards, close the mouth, seal off the mouth and blow into the nose to get the breaths in. With regards to compressions, Snoopy is ideal for one hand. If we get something like a Chihuahua, two fingers in that same area. So we would do two fingers in the same area, all right, with a light enough obvious pressure. And if we got a larger dog like a St. Bernard or the Burmese Mountain Dog, then we would use possibly two hands, all right and all appropriate breathing and appropriate pressure according to the size of your animal. 
just like most animals, you've got those ribs surrounding all those vital organs. If we push on them with the wrong or the right pressure, we may crack one of those ribs or break several of those ribs. What we've got to remember, we've all seen ribs in a butcher. It's all within a casing. What happens is those ribs would break, but very seldom pierce through that, those intercostal muscles they're called. Rather than the, the ribs break through there and, and damage one of the organs, we just get a looser area to do our compressions on. So you would get more effective CPR in that case. So don't be nervous, rather break a rib than not do effective CPR. Although it's nice to practice CPR on a mannequin, which is made specifically for that reason. It gives you nice return energy so you can feel exactly what it's like. Please don't practice this on a healthy live animal because you could damage the ribs and cause injury and arrhythmias. So don't do this on a live healthy pet. Only use it in an emergency. If you are interested in learning how to perform CPR and other emergency techniques, please make sure you've got somebody training you who has experience in first aid, experience in CPR, and also are registered with accredited bodies, awarding bodies, perhaps like the Highfield Awarding Body, HABC, like the old HSC website, Health and Safety Exec, and also teaching the right things, qualified to deliver the course effectively. So there is no license for doing CPR for your dog or doing CPR for somebody else's dog. What you have to bear in mind is people get upset when they have their dogs pass and you're getting involved with that process. So they may look upon your pro, uh, procedures and decide that maybe it was done wrong and they would or could effectively follow that up but I think the nature of people, if you've helped in some way, it's going to make some difference.